name is Mark Flory. I'm a research scientist at Oregon Health and Science University known as OHSU, specifically in the Knight Cancer Institute and within that institute in Cedar, which is the Cancer Early Detection Advanced Research Center, where we focus, as the name implies, on cancer early detection. I'm very excited today and appreciate the opportunity to talk about the CR Proteograph platform and some of the original proof of concept uh, validation work that we did to vet the platform when we were first introduced to it. And we looked at the outputs of this platform uh, and compared those to outputs from a simple comparator set uh, from peptide fractionation. So my focus at OHSU and the Knight Cancer Institute is mostly on proteomics, but more broadly, the Knight Cancer Institute is focused on cancer detection, and which is the focus of the center that I'm in, CEDAR, uh, cancer therapeutics, and cancer prevention. And our efforts are interdisciplinary, involving uh, a large effort from our clinicians to help us shape our research studies, and we also have a significant amount of facilitating engineering work. My work in proteomics is mainly focused on mass spectrometry, and we've recently deployed and are very excited about a Bruker Timstoff uh, Pro mass spec system uh, that has uh, affords high sensitivity and low sample inputs. And this is great for the types of samples that we typically get, such as fine needle aspirates, uh, liquid biopsy enrichments, and the like. Uh, we're also interested in addition to discovery proteomics using mass spectrometry, targeted proteomics using platforms such as Nanostrings, Geomics, Digital Spatial Platform. So we feel strongly that proteomics is an essential component of our studies in cancer early detection for not only discovering but validating uh, biomarkers and signatures that it will be prognostic and diagnostic of disease. And this is really evidenced nicely by a statement in the abstract of a paper that was published not long ago by Paul Boutros's group, where they indicate that mRNA abundance changes explain only about 10% of protein abundance variability from their multiomic studies uh, in which they were focusing on prostate cancer. And as such, really, you get maximal value from these multiomic studies when you augment what you get from genomics, epigenomics, and transcriptomics with proteomic measures as well. And so we really feel strongly that proteomics is an important component of these types of studies. Proteomics, though, however, has, uh, is challenged greatly in that ideally we would do our discovery and validation directly in the fluid uh, that's going to be used in endpoint clinical assays, and that should be an accessible fluid and one that's typically drawn in the clinic, and that's blood or its derivatives, plasma and serum. That is a big challenge for proteomics, particularly for mass spectrometry-based proteomics, because of the enormous dynamic range from the highest abundance to lowest abundant proteins, which span over 10 orders of magnitude. And this makes it very difficult for instruments, even with the fastest and most sensitive mass spectrometry instrumentation, to sample what's often called the dark corner of the proteome, which is those low abundance proteins where it's hypothesized that most diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers are, will reside. So we've attacked the dynamic range issue in a number of different ways. Uh, one way is to use biological enrichments of proteome subpopulations that we feel will be enriched gold mines of biomarkers. And it's just by, in, in this way, we decrease the complexity of the sample, uh, allowing the mass spec to survey more of the features there with a focused biochemical enrichment. And an example of this would be extracellular vesicles that are thought to contain uh, protein and other types of biomarkers that would be rich in information uh, signaling either diagnostic or prognostic information about disease. We've also taken approaches where we use tumor proximal specimens, uh, liquid biopsy types, for example, in the case of prostate cancer, urine or seminal fluid, uh, with the hypothesis that will be enhanced signals that we can detect using things like mass spectrometry. And once detected and discovered, we can attempt to port these to fluids that are more accessible or more often drawn in the clinic, something like blood, plasma, serum. Um, and this is an approach that we've also taken um, in addition to biological enrichments. Uh, there is the approach of doing brute force traditional separation methods, such as fractionation and depletion. We've typically shied away from these because while they can 
achieve some depth in fluids like plasma. They're not a scalable method, uh, minimal to high throughput, sam a large sample cohort studies. Faster mass spectrometry instrumentation with better separation power is all, always uh, a great help, and we feel like uh, our Bruker Timstoff Pro platform gives us a very powerful tool in that respect. And now we are extremely excited about the CO proteograph platform that uses nanoparticle enrichment uh, that allows, uh, as we'll show in the next few slides, one to sample with depth, with consistency, and in a scalable manner, allowing for the first time for proteomics to be done in discovery mode in, in much the same way that genomics and transcriptomics has enjoyed uh, over the past many years. So when we were first introduced to the proteograph platform, we wanted, to, we wanted to vet in our own hands that this platform worked really as advertised uh, because the, the potential that was described was so great. We were very excited about it, but we wanted to see it with our own eyes and own hands. So we worked together with SEER involving a, a trip uh, by myself to the SEER site, and I worked with sci scientists there to pr do enrichments, proteograph enrichments, from a common pooled plasma input uh, sample. So we used 10 nanoparticles to enrich proteins from plasma, which were then digested and then analyzed by data-dependent acquisition on a, a thermo-lumos uh, tribird mass spectrometer at the SEER site. We took aliquots at OHSU of the same plasma material and used a method known as EFAS that we've used traditionally for all types of different uh, proteomic sample types. Um, and this is enhanced filtrated sample preparation. It allows for very efficient solubilization extraction of proteins from a sample. The kaotropes, SDS, and others are removed uh, and washed away from the sample, and then the sample is digested in an amicon filter. The peptides are collected. In this case, we took it one step further by doing peptide fractionation using orthogonal high pH or basic reverse phase separation across eight fractions, each of which were analyzed on the same LUMOS instrument that was used for the material that was gained from the SEER proteograph uh, platform. Uh, we then did our own independent analysis, as did SEER, uh, and then circled back with the SEER uh, scientists, and we really came to the same conclusions. Together, we looked at uh, three key metrics. Uh, one is the proteomic coverage or the depth achieved, how deep into the dynamic range do each of these methods achieve, and uh, is the, are the measurements that were achieved at this depth reproducible and consistent across technical replicates? And finally, we asked how long and how much manual labor was involved uh, for both of the methods, and that really points to whether or not the methods, either of the methods, are, have enough throughput to be scalable to large sample cohorts. So in terms of proteomic coverage, the Venn diagram shows pretty clearly right off the bat that the SEER proteograph achieves uh, a, a much better coverage, about four, four times greater uh, number of protein group identifications uh, than did the basic reverse phase peptide fractionation approach. Uh, SEER proteograph also had a, a far greater number, over 1,100 uh, protein family IDs that were identified exclusively by SEER proteograph and not identified by the peptide fractionation approach. And for this analysis, we required the uh, IDs to be, uh, have been found in all three technical replicates in, in both methods. So in addition to the numbers, which pointed to a, a good uh, penetration of the dynamic range, uh, we, we went further and showed that with waterfall plots, that indeed, uh, we achieved about a 10 times greater, deeper profiling on average, and that's uh, the, based on the median intensity being 10 times lower for SEER proteograph. And to, to ascertain this, we used as reference the mass spec intensities from what I like to call a heroic effort from Steve Carr's group, uh, the somewhat now famous Kosheshian paper, where they did enormous amounts of depletion and fractionation, a very laborious process to go as deeply as one could go at the time into the plasma dynamic range. We feel that given the separation that was done here of the sample and the depletion, that the mass spec intensities are a reasonable rough rubric of concentration range of proteins in plasma and are suitable for this type of relative comparison across methods. So we mapped our identifications to the intensities 
uh, found in the Kasheshian paper. And you can see that in the waterfall plots is when they're lower uh, on the plot, that suggests that the method was achieving more penetration into the dynamic range, better sampling of lower abundance proteins. And you can see that's case for a proteograph, both for the unique proteins that it found and for the total proteins. Uh, not so much the case for the peptide fractionation approach. And uh, a very small number, as reflecting the VINs shown earlier, of unique peptide identifications for the, the fractionation approach. We took this one step further uh, by looking at the classes of proteins based on enrichment analysis that were found by the two methods. And Proteograph <clears throat> identified a far more diverse set of proteins based on word size uh, frequency distribution display using tools such as Go and Panther. Whereas the peptide fractionation approach was dominated by high abundance protein classes, such as the immunoglobulins. In terms of reproducibility, we looked at the coefficients of variation across the three technical replicates that were done for each of the two methods and plotted these uh, as violin plots. And you can see is with lower CV uh, representing uh, higher reproducibility, see so your proteograph. Uh, is about has about two greater precision, twofold greater precision than does basic reverse phase fractionation, and that's true for the total proteins identified, shown at the uh, the left and rightmost violin plots, and then for proteins that were identified commonly by the two methods, it's also reflected that the CVs and the reproducibility was much greater for proteograph. So we showed not only that we're gaining more protein IDs with a better penetration of the dynamic range, uh, with better reproducibility, but we can do this with less time and less work being invested with SEER proteograph. And that's shown in this slide uh, that's currently displayed in that if we combine the time required to do the proteograph enrichments, peptide drying and mass spec acquisition, it's about twofold less time than was required with the peptide fractionation approach, which required a, a long and a manual laborious EFAS process, fractionation, peptide drawing, and mass spec acquisition. So this suggests that we're not only getting better data from SEER proteograph, but it's, it requires less input. And I should say mass, less, much less manual labor for the preparation step, especially now with the liquid handler being deployed that we're uh, going to be deploying at OHSU very soon. Um, that allows for more hands-off time um, and the sample prep and automation that allows for more consistent preparation as well across uh, a large number of samples. So in terms of summary and next steps, um, I think we've shown that here that uh, versus uh, a very simple comparator in terms of that using peptide fractionation that the SEER proteograph demonstrates better proteomic coverage depth and precision um, and it's a scalable approach that is more feasibly amenable to large sample cohorts, which are really required to statistically power large discovery and validation studies for biomarkers. We're really excited to be now combining the power of Proteograph with our Bruker Timstoff Pro mass spec platform. We're seeing boosts in IDs with this platform, uh, the, the Timstoff, and now we're assessing accuracy and reproducibility. Um, and we have multiple ongoing and planned studies now to actually take these two tools, Proteograph and our Timstoff, and apply them to actual cohorts for biomarker discovery, uh, not only in solid indications, but also in hematologic indications as well. So to round things out, I'd like to acknowledge the SEER team at large. I've had a great deal of interaction with folks across the board at SEER, but particularly uh, shown on the left here, Juan Cuevas, and on the right, John Bloom, uh, in frequent meetings um, and for this POC work. And it's just been a great collaboration, and I want to thank them for their work in developing this, what I think is really breakthrough technology for proteomics at scale. I couldn't have done, and nor could I do, really any of the work that I've done without the help of Dr. Matthew Chang here at OHSU Cedar, uh, working with a colleague on all things really proteomic related. Um, uh, including Proteograph, and he's made invaluable contributions to developing our, our proteomics, proteomic data analytic workflows. Um, and final thanks goes to Dr. Bruce Brand-Showed, one of our CEDAR distinguished scientists, 
um, Alliance Manager at OHSU at Kenamadu, and Cedar Management for supporting this collaboration and really helping and supporting us in getting Cedar Proteograph vetted and now integrated into our workflows for biomarker discovery and validation here at OHSU.